I needed to jump up here and uh, make an announcement, so I wanted to say welcome to everybody. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, we are really, really, really thrilled that uh, we have such a great crowd on this beautiful fall day at the beginning of fall break. A lot of times this is a Sunday when there's just not a ton of people here, a lot of people out of town, but we got a great group of smiling faces, and so we're glad everybody's here. I asked Joshua to come up here for uh, just a minute. Uh, One of the things that's happening right now that we'll make sure you guys are aware of is as I'm transitioning into Terrell's role, uh, Terrell will be retiring December 31st, and so we're starting to make some more moves in how often I preach and the Bible classes I teach. We're also transitioning some adults, Ryan and Joshua and Trey and their families into working with the youth. And so Joshua wanted to mention a couple things that are coming up for the youth that uh, are really important. Yeah. So we will be doing celebration. It is the fourth, fifth, and sixth weekend. Um, as you know, it's a wonderful weekend for the youth, but it's also it, traditionally in the past been a wonderful weekend for uh, those that are, want to chaperone. So I need some volunteers to come, especially ladies. I'm going to be involved as well. Um, I'll be working a little late on Friday night, but then joining Friday and staying all weekend with the boys. And I'm also going to need some girls. Blair? November. November 4th, 5th, and 6th. Um, It's going to be held up at the Kentucky Dam Convention Center. And uh, Ryan and Trey are going to be the big dogs on the sound and the lighting and... uh, um, uh, Tyson. Tyson is going to be doing the light. Thanks, Ryan, too. Tyson's going to be there, too, so it'll be a good time to see him. But I need some volunteers for the youth. I'm sure I can count on Abby. We'll be helping with the ladies. Um, we'll be staying. The, the cabins have already been booked. But come to me and let me know if you're interested. Youth, come, come to me as well. Um, also, we're doing our trunk or treat the, this the 15th right? Yep. The 15th. Um, I've encouraged on the last, uh, something's happening that, um, we're trying to fill up my whole driveway. I've been wanting to do that the whole time. And we've only gotten like five on each side. And I love to do the whole driveway. You don't have to decorate your car. Just bring candy and park and the kids will go down. But if I can get you to decorate, throw some kind of skeleton or something in the back of your trunk, but we're going to be going back and forth down the driveway. We have a fire and a hayride and it's just a ton of not fun. Not at the same time. There's not not, a, no, that... They're separate events. Well, well, if we do that, Ben will be there to help out. But uh, we, we've had games in the past. We're just, it's just a ton of fun. We will provide hot dogs and buns if you could provide anything else that goes with that. If you want chili great. If you want chips, whatever, just bring whatever you have and uh, come and join us. It starts at five and it ends whenever you want to leave. So thank you so much. Yeah, I really encourage you to come to that. It is really a lot of, a lot of fun. I've done a different. That'll be standing for the something's happening for October. Yeah, that'll be the something's happening for October. So please, please mark your calendars and come to that. I also want to give you a quick update about what's going on around the building, which you've seen. I want to, uh, I don't even know if Flint is here. Is Flint here? Is he here somewhere? Flint, Rand is here. Uh, Flint has worked so hard on the, on the front. And so Randy can share our appreciation with him. Let's give him a round of applause that you can tell him. He, he saved us a ton of money by doing that. And now uh, he's, I think, going to bring some fill dirt. And we're going to seed that. And we're going to have grass out there. We won't have cement until later. The cement has to wait. Uh, the gravel's got to compact and all that. But uh, it's, it's coming along. Glenn's been working on it. Other people, Royce is working on a project. And I want to just highlight, uh, we believe that if people do a really good job, they should be recognized. So our painter, Steve Settles, that we hired, he's the same guy that, that did the brick in here. He's done the whole building. He's come back several times to do touch up and, and these windows. And I just want to tell you all, he's been fabulous. We, he's been great to work with. So we highly endorse Steve uh, if you need a painter. But we, we just want to make sure if you know Steve or if you run into him to tell him how much you appreciate it. Because this was a big job, very expensive job. He was very affordable and has been so easy to work with. So we're grateful for him. We've got um, the electricians uh, have been out here. And uh, if you notice, there are new lights on this side of the building uh, that shine out into the parking lot. No more conduit. It all goes up into the soffit. And those lights are, there's four of them instead of two, and they're twice as bright. So the parking lot's going to be more secure at night. They're going to be adding them to this side. They're going to be adding cans along the front. Um, So we're really grateful. They're also doing some work in here so we can get some better stage lighting. 
And so we're very grateful for what they're doing, uh, as well as putting some new lights over the van to keep that secure at night. So lots of things happening. We're still maybe a month away from the gutters and stuff, and the architects are working on drawing and getting the state to approve the plans for the bathrooms and the porch. So we're going to try and keep you updated. If it's redundant, I'm sorry, but we want you guys to know what's happening. Feel free to ask any questions at any time to any of us that are involved in that project. Uh, I think that's everything we wanted to cover this morning, but we do want to do one thing before we start singing, and I didn't tell Glenn about this. We hadn't done this in a while, but it feels like the right morning for it. Take about a minute and get up and shake a hand, give somebody a hug, welcome them, tell them you're glad that they're here. So would all the Kid Power Kids please come up here. Kid Power Kids to the front, please. Kid Power Kids to the front. Thank you. Thank you. And again, Kid Power Kids to the front. Kid Power Kids to the front. Please have a seat along the bench. Thank you. All right, any more Kid Power Kids? Any more Kid Power Kids? That's what we got. All right, thank you. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? Y'all all right? Okay. Okay, so stand up if, 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 wait, if you've ever heard anybody say a prayer before. No, y'all haven't ever heard anybody say a prayer ever in your whole life. No? I, that's what I thought so. Okay. All right, sit back down. Okay, now stand up if you've ever actually said a prayer. Okay, well, I mean, if you haven't, that's okay. I mean, you're young. Okay, so people who have, y'all can sit down. People who have said a prayer, who taught you how to do that? Your dad? Okay. Your aunt? Okay, good. Who about you? Your mom? Your dad? Okay, there you go. Well, today we're going to talk about a very special prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. You may have heard of it. The nickname for it is the Lord's Prayer. So here's how it sounds. I'll take your shoes off in a very old version of the Bible. It's actually 411 years old. Y'all know about that? 400 years old. Okay, let me find it. Okay, here we go. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now that's a very old way of talking and it has a lot of fancy words, but it is really pretty. Now, here's another way to say it. Here's what it sounds like in this book. All right, can y'all see the pictures? 
Hello, Daddy. We want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again and in our hearts too. Do what is best, just like you do in heaven, and please do it down here too. Please give us everything we need today. Forgive us for doing wrong, for hurting you. Forgive us just as we forgive other people when they hurt us. Rescue us. We need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God. You can do whatever you want. You are in charge now and forever and always. We think you're great. Amen. Yes, we do. Now, there are a lot of different ways to pray. Y'all know that. You can say what you think up yourself, or you can use what someone else has written, like that prayer we just read. Or you can mix it up. Any way is fine. God just wants to hear from his kids. with me please we've got a lot of folks on fall break so your responsibility is to sing for two people not just one let the Lord hear your voice I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised so shall I from my enemies, the Lord liveth and bless me the rock. Let God of my salvation be exalted. Lord liveth and bless me the rock. Let God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord.
Luke 22, 39 through 46. This is when Jesus prays on the Mount of Olives. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Thank you, Ella. I also want to just share a quick word, as Brian did, regarding the work that's going on around the building. So many good things that are happening. It doesn't happen nearly as quickly as we would like, but it is happening. And uh, there may be a little bit of a speeding of that process we're in right now. And we are really, really deeply grateful for that. So thanks for your patience and for all of the people who are participating. Uh, I especially like something else that Flint told me. Is Flint here? He's not, Flint is not here. Well, then I can say this about Flint then. Okay. And, and nobody will have to repeat it. Now, Flint is uh, one of those people who likes to be behind the scenes doing things. He's not somebody who's going to be up front cracking the whip and driving things hard. But behind the scenes, he enjoys participating in that kind of way. When Flint uh, does something that involves heavy equipment, the first thing you do is use the equipment five minutes and then work on it five days because that's just the way it goes with heavy equipment. But uh, Flint has done that and has kept the repairs up. And uh, we, we've, I think Flint is finished with his job out at the front right now with uh, removing the asphalt that's been removed. But Flint had a conversation with me uh, this past week that I really appreciated. He said, now, would you tell me again um, the, the financial situation of the church? He said, I, from what I'm hearing, the request has been that we need about another thousand dollars a week if we hire the person that we would like to hire to come in and work here as minister. He said, is that right? And I said, yeah, that, that's what Glenn said a couple of weeks ago when he made that presentation. And he said, you know, I think that we can do that. I've looked at my finances. Okay, now, Randa, it involves you at this point. He said, I've looked at my finances, and, and we're going to increase our contributions. And he said, I, I think that all of us together should be able to do $1,000. What do you think, Terrell? My response was, sure we can, Flint. We can do that. And I was really encouraged to get that feedback from him. Um, my wife has retired and our income has declined and our contributions consequently have declined. But again, this morning, we usually write a check first uh, Sunday of the month. We looked at what those, what our income was and the thought runs through my mind. What could we do? How could we do this better than we are doing it? And unfortunately, it does involve money. Fortunately, God's given us everything that we have, and he's just asked us to freely give back in return. So whatever we give, we actually are giving what God gave us to start with. The church's financial situation took a radical twist uh, a couple of years ago when the property next door was donated to us. It's easy for us to forget that. And somewhere over a quarter million dollars was a gift from that property. When that money was given and it went into our checking account, our church balance a little more than doubled. And it looked like we had just a ton of money and we're just collecting money and going to let that accumulate as much as possible. Well, truth is that if COVID had not struck, many of the things you're seeing done at the building would have already been done. COVID put a halt on that and, and we couldn't prevent that. So all we do is 
sit on that money and wait. So now we're spending it pretty quickly. Um, we're going to be spending it a whole lot more quickly. But the intention was never, never to accumulate money. That's just due to COVID and the difficulty in working with contractors and architects and getting things done right now. If you wanted to build a house today, you'd be in a hot pickle if you had to get it up in a hurry because you'd probably find it difficult to find a, an architect or a contractor who could get to you anytime in the near future. So was it 270,000 that came from that house? Approximately 270 that came from it. And pardon? 167 or 267? 167. He's saying 267. Penny, how much? Oh, she's not here. All right. Somewhere between those two amounts. And uh, we are in the process of using that for the upgrading of our facility. So I just wanted you to know that um, we are looking at our finances and seeing how we can make some adjustments as we continue making a difference in uh, the facilities around here. So thank you for your kindness and your participation. I'm counting down. You don't have to count down with me, but I have six sermons left to preach this year before I retire. That may be good. It may not be good. Depends on perspective. Uh, I'm, in, I'm entering into that with some enthusiasm. So this is number six to go. And uh, Brian was gracious to give me Christmas Day. So I get that sermon as well. Uh, Christmas is one of those days that, you know, what else do you say about Christmas? So we'll see if we can work something out in the next three or four months about Christmas. Um, but today, it's the Lord's Prayer. All kinds of hindrances prevent a robust prayer life like most of us know we ought to have and even want to have. The least of these certainly is not time. Time is challenging for us. My exercise routine has declined the past uh, couple of months somewhat due to time. Since Teresa retired and doesn't awaken every morning at 3.07 a.m. as in the past, uh, I found it more difficult to get started early. I was typically in the gym at four o'clock working out for about an hour. And that has changed. And now, if either of us is able to sleep past four o'clock, the other one lies there awake, not moving, not wanting to wake the other one up. So failure to exercise between four and 5 a.m. makes it unlikely that I will engage exercising at another time during the day. Prayer is a lot like that. Without a routine, it's unlikely to occur. Distraction also stands in the way of prayer. Inability to focus occurs because we're busy and tired and the list goes on. Without prioritizing prayer like I prioritize my morning coffee, it's unlikely that we'll find time. And no doubt many of us work with full plates, sometimes choosing what we do next by listening for what's louding, screaming loudest on our plates with so much happening in our lives distraction from prayer can very easily rule the day and let's just go ahead and mention the obvious reason satan the devil doesn't want us praying with the almighty god he knows he can't compete with our sovereign god and that he doesn't have the power that god has he knows if we access that power he loses so he wants to keep us weak and unfocused, and he clouds our judgment about important things. Many Christians are convinced that American Christianity began losing its power in 1962 when mandatory prayer was removed from our schools and then Bible reading was removed the next year. Life magazine dubbed Madeleine Murray O'Hare the most hated woman in America. With a budget of less than $20,000, she single-handedly removed prayer from the classroom. And not even one 
Christian organization, not even one church in America, not even one fought her. Eighteen attorneys generals opposed her, but they didn't have enough grounding to stop her. Yet we know it wasn't the atheist O'Hare who was the real problem. Satan was. John Stott pondered what he called the illogical paradox, that we love to pray and we feel satisfied when we do, yet respond to a hundred and one other alternatives rather than prayer. He writes, what is the reason for this illogical paradox? I have no explanation, he says, for that paradox except the devil. The devil knows that prayer is the major secret of Christian living, and thus he is determined to stop it. One final hindrance to prayer in, is misunderstanding or even unbelief. God isn't some kind of celestial Santa Claus who exists to respond to our requests. Yet many believers become disenchanted with prayer because they ask and don't receive as expected and they feel distant from God or even betrayed. Maybe this would be a good place to pause and ask if we might lack a better understanding of prayer. I know I can't address all the questions that you might have about prayer and problems related to it, but I can share a few thoughts this morning, and I'd like to do that from where Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Luke chapter 11. I'm going to be working through this entire text, so if you have a Bible or a phone, you might want to keep it open here because you can interact back and forth. I won't read it but this one time, though. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, the parallel text to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, where Jesus taught the more popular form of the Lord's Prayer. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, how to be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, Lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My kids are and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, Ask, and it'll be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus' prayer life had attracted his disciples' attention. They were all well aware that communing with God was Jesus' top priority. Luke tells us that Jesus prayed at his baptism after a busy day, before choosing the 12, before Peter's confession, at his transfiguration, when the 70 missionaries returned, before teaching his apostles to pray, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night he was prayed, Jesus prayed. Ella read that text to us. And from the cross, Jesus prayed two prayers. So it's natural that 
committed disciples would want their teacher to teach them about prayer. When you have no words for your own prayers or when you don't know what to pray, or maybe you, you feel empty, the Lord's Prayer is what you're looking for. 38 words in Greek, 57 words in Greek in Matthew, and it's one of the single most important gifts Jesus has given his people, his prayer. Yet I'd like us to probe just a little bit deeper in the passage, looking deeper than just the words of the prayer and into what we might learn about the characters in Luke 11. And we don't typically think about the characters. So that's what you do when you've been preaching at one church for 40 years almost. You go back and ask, what have I not talked about in this passage that I might talk differently about? And it would be the Holy Trinity in Luke chapter 11. The word I'd like for you to think about in this passage are the characters and how we're enlightened about them. How we're enlightened about Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And as we've already seen, this passage enlightens us about the important prayer, how important prayer was to Jesus and how those closest to Jesus recognized its importance in his life. They knew the vital role it occupied for Jesus. It was one of the things Luke wanted us to notice, which is why he mentioned Jesus' prayer life in a total of eight chapters in his gospel. I mean, a full one-third of the chapters of Luke have something to say about the way that Jesus prayed. You don't find that kind of emphasis in other gospels about Jesus' prayer life. So the Lord's prayer is more than just a prayer. It's enlightenment about Jesus and it's insight and enlightenment about the Father. The Lord's prayer enlightens us to the nature of God. In these few words, we learn that God is to be praised above all else. That God the Father is our sovereign Father who is the source of everything good and whose kingdom rule make other kings look pathetic. He owns it all. We need God's kingdom, Jesus says. We need the benevolent reign of God in our lives. God's kingdom is a resource that can't be purchased, but is readily free for the taking as a gift from God. And it's all about what humans need for survival. Even more, not just survival, but to be able to thrive on the planet that God created for us, a place for us to live in his presence. In the Father's kingdom rule, we find divine protection, unmerited grace, unlimited resources, precious gifts, everything good is what we receive in his kingdom. So when we pray for his kingdom, we're asking for the fullness of God's rule to come into our lives which means we're praying for the complete rule of God to come, not just in our lives, but everywhere. It's a prayer for the end of the world. It's a prayer for the renewal of all things. It's a prayer for the new heavens and the new earth to come. We pray that God will renew everything. And help us to want that renewal more and more and more with every breath we take. Another priceless gift humans need is food. God's storehouses are filled with food. Far more than we could imagine. And the good news is he's eager to share it. What he wants us to recognize is that it comes from him as a gracious gift that sustains life. God could have made us so that we might function without the need for food. I don't know what that would have looked like exactly, but because God is sovereign, I'm confident he could have done that if he had wanted to. Yet he made our bodies 
so that we need food. Every few hours, we need to be replenished. Eat breakfast at 7, and by noon, we're all thinking about the same thing. Eat at noon, and about 5 or 6, we're thinking about it again. And probably before we go to bed, that ice cream sounds good. God made us this way so that we will not forget that we need Him because He has all the food. Hunger here drives us to God here. And it's something we should never, never forget. He is the source of all nourishment. So certainly we should keep asking God for generous distributions of food because if he doesn't give it, there won't be any. But we also need help with our failures. Sin that incessantly attacks and destroys. All of us have failed and will again fail to honor God as we ought. We know how much we need God, yet there are times we act as if we can provide for ourselves quite well without Him, and that doing things the way we would prefer to do them is the better option. Hopefully, we quickly learn about the misdirection Satan has thrown at us and how he's covered our eyes so that we can't really see, so that we'll very quickly ask God to forgive us for the sin of Adam that has become our own. Just think about how audacious it is to borrow money from someone and to go to that person and say, I'd like you to forget that I owe you anything. Those are the shoes that a sinner feels. When he's done something against God, which is the object of all of our sins. Our sin is against the sovereign God and only he can forgive. How bold to ask for that. And yet God says, please do. I want to give it. This part of the Lord's prayer though comes with a caveat. Those who ask for forgiveness must be a forgiving people who forgive others who sin against them. We've all been offended. If you're in a relationship with someone long enough, it usually takes about a minute and a half, they're going to hurt you, even as you will hurt them. Relationships can continue only on the basis of mutual confession and forgiveness. God models for us how to keep relationships alive and growing it's done by forgiveness of one another. And finally, the Lord's Prayer tells us we need the kingdom power to keep temptation at a safe distance. The prayer begins with the sovereign kingdom of power of God and concludes with an enemy from whom we need deliverance. We know that God made us, that we belong to him. My body is God's body. He made it. So God defines the boundaries for those bodies. What we do with them and what we do not do with them. It is God's to define. I'm his creation. Only God has the authority to declare the function of things for that he made with his own hands. Consequently, we desire as his people to live within his purposes and to pray for deliverance from temptation that lures us out of his purposes, acting the way that we want to act in ways other than God designed. We know the Bible is our final authority for defining right and wrong, regardless of how strong our urges might be to the contrary. We honor the God who made us. The kingdom is under attack. And those seeking it must pray for food for the present, forgiveness from the past, and deliverance in the future. From the Father to the devil, from heaven to hell, in these requests we connect with our resourceful, gracious, sovereign God who loves us and is eager to provide everything we need. So what else do we need to know? 
We've been enlightened about Jesus' prayer life, and we've been enlightened about the God who provides, and that should be enough. But Luke tells us Jesus had a little bit more to say about the Father. There's some more enlightenment that we need. Not so much about prayer, but about the God we pray to. He wants to enlighten us about God's passionate devotion to his people. So God... Jesus tells us a parable about a man who had an unexpected guest to arrive late one night. He went next door to one of his neighbors and asked to borrow some bread to feed his guest. And it's not because the guy was beating on the door and wouldn't stop, but it's because of the hospitality of the one inside the house. If you'll look at footnotes in some Bibles or in some study Bibles, It will give that distinction. It's not the pounding that causes the man to open the door. It's the heart of the one inside who opens the door. Remember the movie Lone Survivor? Based on one of our Navy SEALs team's experiences in Afghanistan in 2005. It illustrates well what I'm talking about. All members of the team had been killed by Taliban soldiers except Marcus Luttrell, played by Mark Wahlberg. Some Afghan villagers found Luttrell's badly wounded body and took him into their home to take care of him. Why would they do that? Because hospitality is highly prized in Middle Eastern culture. The Afghans felt obligated to take care of Luttrell even at significant risk to themselves. They ignored the risk because they are honorable and brought him into their home. Most English translations assume the neighbor gets out of bed and gives bread to the man because he won't stop pounding at the door. However, everyone who has any experience with Middle Eastern culture knows that's not the way their culture works. A footnote at verse 8 will clear it up and let you know we're talking about the guy inside the house who's bold, not the guy outside the house. So he gets up, opens the door for his neighbor, and gives him bread. One of my former professors, one many of you have met and know quite well, uh, Everett Hufford, spent years as a missionary in the Middle East. And he wrote an article about this particular parable in the Lord's Prayer. In that article, he explained Middle Eastern culture and how most translations completely miss the culture in the way that they translate it. It would be shameful to refuse hospitality to someone in need. It would be embarrassing to the whole community, giving the whole community a black eye if you denied hospitality to a stranger Because he is a man of honor, he gets up even though his kids are asleep, even though it's midnight, even though he's going to wake up all of the animals that are in the house with him. They bring their goats, sheep inside at night. Even though he's going to wake everything up, he would get up and give the man knocking the bread because he is honorable. And he has the bread to share. Let's reflect a little bit and see if we can be enlightened about God. God doesn't answer prayer because we relentlessly pound at his heart trying to figure out just what kind of heart string to pull on so God will listen to us. God answers our prayer even the simplest briefest prayers because he is a God of honor. He made us. He has our resources. He knows he's the only one who can answer that prayer. Nobody else controls the world's resources. Only he. And God is an honor, an honorable God who owns everything in heaven and on earth. And he loves us. He's gracious. It is unthinkable that you could pray to God and he would not answer. It is unthinkable. 
it is an insult to God to think he would not hear us. But I got to confess that both prayer and God's response to prayer is a mystery for me. I can't fathom it completely. I wish I knew why some people get immediately, immediate responses and others don't or never do. I wish I knew why my prayers during my suffering 20 years ago seemed to go unheard by God. But then I've prayed for others and got really fast response. Last week, Teresa and I called Jonas Roberts and we prayed together for good test results for Jonas when he had his heart cath. He got good test results. But other times I've prayed and I didn't get what I asked for. Jesus understands my frustration. He understands having some prayers answered and others ignored. And yet he prayed some prayers that were not answered. Remember these? Take this cup from me. Remember this one? My God, my God, where are you? Remember that one? There was no voice from heaven like there was at his baptism. But here's what I believe. God loves me far more than I understand. And God is honorable far more than I can fathom. Honorable fathers don't give snakes when their sons ask for fish. And honorable fathers don't give scorpions when they ask for eggs. God gives good gifts to his children. It would be shameful to God for him to do otherwise. So here's my conclusion. I believe if I were God, I'd be running the world exactly as God is running it right now. If I were God. God is infinite. I am not. From his high and lofty position, he sees and acts beyond my ability to understand. I'm only thinking about me. God is thinking about billions of us at the same time. And he loves all of us the same. Here's where I stand, and I invite you into it. I trust God, even when I don't understand Him. I trust Him. And I will trust Him the rest of my life and beyond. I will trust Him. Amen? This passage first enlightens us about Jesus, that prayer was extremely important to Jesus. Then the passage enlightens us about God, that he's our sovereign God. He's our honorable creator who is eager to respond to our cries for help. And finally, the text enlightens us about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. Even as evil dads know the difference between good and bad gifts they give their children, God also knows the difference. And that's why he gives good gifts to his children. The best gift. The Holy Spirit is such a gift. The best gift we could have is the presence of the Spirit in our lives. He walks with us. He fills us. He empowers us to live the life that God has created us to live. The Holy Spirit is the divine presence of God with us. Everywhere we go, everything we do, through every temptation, through every thought, the Spirit of God is there prompting us, urging us, don't, yes, as we travel through life about the things we should or should not do. So the Holy Spirit is the best gift we could have. The gift of God's Son redeems us and reconciles us with God. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the fullness of God that dwells in us and reminds us of how deep and rich the love of God is. Remember from Ephesians 3, Paul's famous prayer. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit. 
in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and founded, established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. There it is. The Spirit at work filling us up so that we can be full of God. So that as we get older, the mysteries about prayer are still there. But they don't discourage you and they don't frustrate you. And they don't cause you to lose faith. Because you're becoming more like God and you come to a conclusion that I shared with you a moment ago. I kind of think if I were God, I'd be doing what God is doing right now. Why should God act any different toward us than we act toward our own children when they don't understand? But we act in their best interest. What we need more than anything else in this world is to know that God loves us, that we're not alone, and that what happens to us in this lifetime is not what defines us forever and ever. What defines us is we are children of God. We are his kids. And the Spirit wants to make sure that we never forget that. I'd like to share one insight about prayer that I've developed. It isn't perfect, but it's something you might find of value too. As I get older, I understand prayer to be less about asking God for stuff. I understand prayer to be more of an invitation from God to partner with him as I go through life to partner with him about his values and priorities and the way that I care. We can care about God's honor and we can desire his kingdom. We can ask that he provide food for billions of people in this world who are hungry and malnourished. We partner with him. We can ask that he not only forgive me of my sins, but that he would give me passion and courage to tell others about his forgiveness so they could enjoy forgiveness through the blood of Jesus as well. And we can ask that God protect our families, our communities, our nation's leaders from temptation, which is the work of Satan. Anywhere there is temptation in our life, whatever it may be from A to Z, anywhere there is temptation. It is an attack from Satan. We need to see the difference between what God is doing and what Satan is doing in our lives. And we can do this with complete confidence that God hears and answers in better ways than any of us can comprehend. All the while loving us with unfathomable love, filling us with his powerful, comforting spirit. Never, never being distant from us, even when it feels like it. Would you pray with me? Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life.
above all A number of years ago, there was a guy who uh, ran from God, uh, just God, God reached out to him. God came after him, but he didn't want any part of it, and he took off, just tried to get as far away from God as he could, but his consequences of his actions eventually caught up with him, and as he was faced with the overwhelming consequence of what he had been, what he had done, what he had chosen, he knew that the only way out was through the water to get immersed in water. And on the other side would come salvation. His name was Jonah, and this was his prayer. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the sea, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me, and I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. 
The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you and to your holy temple. To those who cling to worthless idols, turn away from God's love for them. To those who cling to worthless idols, turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I vowed I will make good, I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. I think this is really an interesting prayer that Jonah prays because Jonah ran from God. And the consequences of of his actions demanded that he be thrown overboard into a raging sea. And we often tell the story as if the, the fish, the whale, whatever it was that swallowed him up was the punishment, but Jonah saw it differently. That was the salvation that delivered him out of the water, that God saved him in the depths. You know, when we come to communion, we tell this same story. We ran from God. We don't want any part of it. Wherever God pursued us, we pushed back. But God continued to run after us. And when our consequences overwhelmed us, he offered us a path to salvation through the water. Communion is a moment where we say salvation comes from the Lord. Communion is a moment where we say God, through his son, through his son's death, burial and resurrection provided a fish, an unexpected savior. Jesus came and made a way for us to be rescued from the depths of the consequences of our sin. And it wasn't an accident that he did it by going through the water. Noah was delivered through the water. The people of Israel were delivered through the water of the Red Sea. Jonah was delivered through the water by the fish. We are delivered through the waters of baptism. Washed, cleansed, renewed. Every time we come, we step out of that water. We step out of that path that God made, the unlikely path to salvation. And we say, thank you. So as we've talked about prayer this morning, I thought it was appropriate that we look at another prayer. Uh, Jonah didn't get it all right after that. He still had a lot to learn. But that prayer was a prayer of faith. And I would just submit to you that each time we come and gather, we pray a prayer of faith. That we say, hey God, I I don't have it all right. I've run from you. The consequences have caught up with me. And you have provided me a way. You have provided me deliverance. And, and I'm going to mess up again. And I'm not going to get it all right again. And I'm going to come back here again. Thank you for that. Thank you for that opportunity. To be saved. Again and again and again. From myself. From my sin. From my consequences. By the blood of Jesus. A sacrifice given one time for all time. For you and me. So let's pray that together and then we'll partake in this. God, thank you for the story of Jonah and the prayer that he prayed thousands of years ago that reminds us today that we are sinking in our own consequences, waves crashing over our head, seaweed around our neck, falling to the bottom of the ocean, gasping for breath and filling our lungs only with water, certain of the end because of our sin, because of our foolishness, because of our folly, because of the sin of others against us and the consequences of those actions, because of the hurts, because of the pains, because of the bitterness we don't want to let go of, because of the anger, because of the lust, because of the jealousy, all of these things that are crushing us. And in the most unlikely manner, you part a sea, you send a fish, you send a child to a backwater town with unimportant parents to be the savior of the entire world. 
And our prayer in this moment is thank you for his blood, his body that delivers us and lifts us out of the pit, sets us on dry land and says, come and follow me and be mine and sit at my table and eat with me for all of eternity. I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you for that, Lord. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with me? Agnes Day, Lamb of God. Brian was right. It was 270000 <laughs> So my senior moment on full display, but it gives an opportunity for reconciliation and forgiveness. Right, Brian? Where'd you go? And Tara was closer to right than I was. And emotionally, I feel better. Why? Not because I admitted all this, because, whoa, we got another 100000 I forgot we got. <laughs> Does it make things better? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. See, I'm already feeling better. All right. Holy, for he is holy. And the scripture says for us as people of the colony of the kingdom of God to be holy because I am holy. So go this week and be holy because he is holy. Thank you.